So let's talk through the movement phase of Warhammer 40k 10th edition and how your models are going to be getting around the board to take the fight to the enemy. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where today we're continuing in our How to Play 40k 10th edition series. Now moving on from the command phase to the movement phase, how the miniatures traverse the battlefield, what the options are for different types of moves that you can do, and things like falling back, desperate escape, and the arrival of reserves. In today's video we're going to cover the core mechanics of the 10th edition movement phase, basically broken down into two main steps, the active player moving their units, and they do have a few different options for how they can choose to do so, and then the arrival of reinforcements on the board, and we'll mention deep strike and strategic reserve as the main way that you can put units in reserve. In this one we'll focus on the core of the movement phase, we'll talk about terrain in its own video, and there will be a number of special units that work a bit differently here, transports, aircraft and super heavy vehicles will be covered in their own video on those unique unit types. We'll start off with the basics and how models move around the board, and it has changed in a few major ways since 9th edition. When it comes to your first movement phase in Warhammer 40k, you might have a setup somewhat like this. Below the orange line is your deployment zone, the enemy is somewhere off the map up towards the top there. You've got a bunch of squads set out, and some tanks and things lurking in the background, maybe a leader in a unit or two, no doubt just having finished any command phase abilities that they have had in the previous phase. For the rest of the turn you'll be then moving up, shooting with your guns, and then charging into combat and fighting there. In Warhammer 40k, movement stats and characteristics are usually done in inches, that's what's recorded on each model's datasheet in the movement box, and also it's how ranges are measured as well. In game most people use a handy lightweight tape measure that you can expand and collapse to get movement distances, really quite handy say if you needed to move a whole bunch of models 6 inches, just pop it out to that and move them each one by one. In the movement phase you'll select each unit in turn, and then do the full movement with that unit, you can't move part of a squad and then move to a different part and then come back to it, it's unit by unit, you don't have to move everything as we'll get on to in a second, remaining stationary is one of the options. For most units that aren't engaged in combat, you can either choose to advance or normal move. Choosing to advance robs you of options later in the turn, but does get you a little bit more movement, which can be better for quite a lot of units. Typically in Warhammer 40k, I'd say for most armies most of the time, you do want to move with the vast majority of units. It's kind of rare that your positioning is already perfect, literally everything's got line of sight on what it needs to, or doesn't want to be getting closer to the enemy to make combat. Even for units that want to be absolutely nowhere near the enemy, you might want to be moving them out of line of sight or hiding them, or getting towards objectives. The main actual reasons to remain stationary are say if you're locked in combat and you don't want to fall back out of it, which has its negative effects. You might get rules benefits from remaining stationary, like certain heavy weapons, they'll often get better ballistic skill if they can stay still, or say if you're just already on an objective, there's no real reason to move on from it, and you're not really going to gain anything from shuffling around your position just a little bit. When you're measuring units movement in Warhammer 40k, it's mostly pretty intuitive, your unit moves 10 inches, so that's how far it goes across the tabletop. If you're just moving a unit simply in one line, it is kind of important to measure from the same point of the model when you move that 10 inches though, say the Space Marine Gladiator tank on the top example, that way you've measured from the front to the front, so the tank has actually moved 10 inches. It's quite a common beginner mistake to measure from the front of the tank to the back of the tank, and thereby gain the entire tank's length as an extra movement, in actual fact moving it far faster than it should be able to. If you're not just moving models in straight lines and say you're turning around corners or going around terrain, the general rule is that any one part of the model can't move further than the movement characteristic, so say for example in the top example you have moved the Space Marine Gladiator 10 inches, but because you've basically also done a bit of a power slide type manoeuvre, and you've turned it round, it means that the back corner has moved a bit more than 10 inches, around about 12, so if you did want to turn the model as you moved it like that, you might need to sacrifice a little bit of raw movements, just to make sure that that back corner doesn't go too far. It can also be a little bit less obvious if you need to say go around a terrain feature or something, actually getting a big model to clear say a ruined wall which this black rectangle represents in the middle. You might actually need a surprising amount of movement to get your entire model to clear around that wall, and often I find the easiest way is just to measure from place to place to see how far you can get. A lot of units in Warhammer 40k aren't just single models though, they're squads that must maintain a unit coherency. This basically meaning that your squads must operate as individual blocks of units and not just get spread out all over the board, otherwise they're not really squads there. In Warhammer 40k, if you've got a squad like this, the basic rule is that your models must maintain coherency within two inches of each other, and they must do so in one solid block, so you can't say have these guys on the left within two inches of each other, 
and then the ones on the right separated out by 4 inches, that wouldn't be allowed. Furthermore, large squads can be a little bit more restrictive as well. If you've got a squad size in Warhammer 40k with 7 or more models in it, they have to bunch up just a little bit more than the smaller squad counterparts as they have to be within 2 inches of 2 different models within the unit, not just one. In practice, this would mean that they'll usually wind up operating like a bit more of a blob as opposed to a strung outline. The rule is there to basically stop people from spreading out a huge unit to 2 inch maximal coherency and operate them like a weird conga line to screen out enemy units or chain to objectives. Most of the time you'll really struggle to break unit coherency. The core rules say that whenever you make a move you must end within it if it's possible, otherwise the unit just simply can't move. So you can't normally move the unit in the top picture and have them wind up as they are in the bottom picture. Perhaps the most common reasons for actually breaking unit coherency is say if the unit took some casualties from enemy shooting, and perhaps if you pulled a model from the centre of the unit, meaning that a whole bunch of them aren't in coherency with each other anymore. Generally speaking, that would be really quite a bad idea. The punishment for breaking unit coherency at the end of the turn is really quite harsh. Basically the controlling player must remove miniatures one by one until the unit is in unit coherency again. Obviously you don't really want to be gifting your opponent free removed models, so generally if you're removing model casualties you want to do it from the edge of the unit and have your unit set up in a way that that isn't going to cause problems. One big change in Warhammer 40k 10th edition is moving through units. In past editions of the game your own models could block your own units from moving through them, but now you're allowed to move through your own squads, presumably they part way and reform to allow that to happen. It means that say the Space Marine Outrider could move straight through these Primaris Aggressors here, obviously not winding up with the end of the move on top of them or anything. The only exception that they've got for that is that monsters and vehicles can't move through other friendly monsters and vehicles, so it means if you've still got a big tank column that's being bogged down by something slow at the front of it, that could still give you some issues and you might want to think about their movement lanes there. For enemy models though, the general rule is that unless you've got a rule that allows you to move over or through them somehow, most units can't go within 1 inches of them in the movement phase. Engagement range usually denotes when you're in close combat with the enemy unit, and it's important in the charge and fight phase. In the movement phase though, just generally the idea is that you just can't wind up within it, as otherwise you'd be making a charge, and engagement range in 10th edition remains 1 inch horizontally and 5 inch vertically of enemy models, so it could also stop you from taking up positions in ruins below them, say if they happen to be on the first floor of a ruined building. Effectively, for most groundbound units, it means that engagement range will kind of block the way for your movement, and screening and move blocking in Warhammer 40k is definitely a good tactical thing to do with cheap units sometimes. There's a big section of terrain rules for 10th edition 40k that we'll go through in a later video, but the basic terrain movement rules that appear in the movement section of the core rules just relate to going up and down things like walls and buildings. For most terrain features like say ruins or say boxy type buildings, the general rule is that you measure your distance up to the base of them, then you move vertically, then you move across any further distance that you might have. So say the Space Marine Intercessor can move 6 inches here, and 3 of those were used to scale this small building. You must have enough movement distance on your characteristic to wind up at the top of the building. For obvious reasons, for model positioning you can't wind up halfway up a wall, even if that might have been very fluffy for things like gene stealers maybe. For terrain and moving across things, certain terrain pieces that are less than 2 inches high can basically be ignored in the movement phase. Many barricades and pipelines might just be basically battlefield debris that your models don't care about too much and can scramble over easily. Finally, before we get into the choices of movement that you can make, flying units also have their own rules as well. Quite a lot of units have the fly keyword at the bottom of their datasheet, and as you'd expect, these guys aren't quite as limited by enemy models being in the way, or having to scramble up physical walls to get to where they need to be. Models with the fly keyword can move over or through all other models, either friendly or enemy, and that includes that previous restriction for vehicles and monsters not being able to move through each other. It seems that if you've got wings you don't have too much trouble in jumping over your fellow monsters apparently. With scaling and moving through terrain, there's a bit of a difference compared with 9th edition 40k. If flying units are moving vertically as well as horizontally, then you measure diagonally. Previously they just tended to ignore vertical distance and could go through ruins and things. That doesn't seem to be an innate part of the fly keyword anymore. So say you could have this Tyranid Prime jumping to this building and just measure 12 inches diagonally from where he started. So that's the basics of how units move covered, but when you come to select your move you actually have 4 basic options that you can choose depending on what the unit's doing before you started. 
Remaining stationary is obviously the default. As mentioned before, a few other rules key off that, like the heavy weapons getting plus one ballistic skill if they do so, and that's what you'll need to do if you want to remain in combat and not fall back and take the penalties for doing that. Then you've got the option to make a normal move, this is exactly as it sounds, move as we've talked about before, and use the movement characteristic on the top left hand corner of the datasheet, you can see it circled for the Terminator squad here, who have a movement characteristic of 5. You can't make a normal move if you're within engagement range of enemy models, if you're locked up then it's the choice of either falling back or remaining stationary. Then, as mentioned before, you've got the option of making an advanced move. This is basically trading your options to deal damage later in the turn for a bit more movement, and it can often be the best thing to do if your unit, say, can't shoot or can't make a charge. Again, you can't do this if you're within engagement range to start with, but basically you get your normal move characteristic plus an extra d6 inches. For the Terminators, that'd be 5. Roll an extra dice, and then the models in the units will be able to move a distance somewhere between 6 and 11 inches, depending on how good you roll. If you make an advanced move like this and focus on movement, you can't shoot almost any of your weapons at all besides the ones that have the assault keyword. It's not the most common keyword in 10th edition, things like Eldar Shuriken catapults are worn, and Custodia's Guardian Spears. Most other weapons though will sacrifice their shooting if they're advancing. And also unless you've got some sort of fancy special rule, you can't normally charge unless you've got something that allows you to do so. Advancing can definitely still be a good idea though if it gets you towards an objective, gets you hidden, or just if your unit didn't have anything meaningful to either shoot or charge. Finally, you've got the option to fall back. This was the option if your unit was already locked in combat in engagement range in the movement phase, and essentially your models make a normal move that must finish out of combat. Disengaging with the enemy though does have its own restrictions and risks. If you're falling back, like say the Space Marine Intercessor wants to because he's found himself in combat with a whole load of orcs, Basically he makes a move very similar to a normal move, it must end outside of engagement range, and then kind of similar to advanced moves, he normally won't be able to either shoot or charge after having done so. It can still be a very good idea if remaining in combat was just going to get him killed and nothing else, but if you do have a pretty powerful unit in combat that might be able to shoot with its pistols, or hopefully deal with the enemy in close combat itself, it might be worth just staying in combat and trying to take the fight to them. Perhaps the biggest risks though, besides not being able to deal damage, is the chance that you might have to take desperate escape. This is the chance that you might potentially lose some models out of the unit when you fall back, and it happens in two different circumstances. First up, if your model moves across enemy models as part of the fallback move, say in this example, the Space Marine Intercessor was entirely surrounded with orcs, there were no clear movement lanes that he could use to get around the models, and he had to fall directly back over enemy units to make his escape. You can do that out of necessity, or you can actually elect to do that it would seem if moving across enemy units would actually be advantageous, say if that was the only way for him to get onto an objective that you desperately needed to score. This will affect most groundbound units, but it doesn't affect fly units which can basically just hop over the enemy, or titanic units where presumably the enemy wants to get out of the way unless they want to get stepped on or run over by some big tracks. For this one you have to take one desperate escape test per model that's doing this, and for that test you basically roll 1d6, on a 1 or 2 for that roll, one model in your unit is slain. Say for example, if you had a unit of 10 intercessors, two of them had to fall back through enemy models, you'd take two tests, but if any models were slain with that, you would be able to choose which ones are in the unit, it wouldn't necessarily have to be the ones that were surrounded. The other circumstance that you'd have to test this if your unit was battle shocked and falling back, is one of the major disadvantages of that. If your unit was battle shocked and they chose to fall back from some onrushing enemies, then you'd have to make one desperate escape test per model in your entire unit. It means that on average, if you fall back with a battle shocked unit, you would lose a third of your squad. Obviously, that could swing very high or low, and it could be a massive risk if you do so with a vehicle or something that's battle shocked. Still, could definitely be worth doing depending on the battlefield scenario, but it's definitely a big penalty to take. Then for the second step of the movement phase, after all your units on the board have moved or chosen not to, that's when you get to bring any reinforcements that you might have off the board if you should wish to. There's a few different rules that can mean that your units will start off the board, perhaps the most common ones either being the Deep Strike Universal Special Rule or Strategic Reserves. A few specific armies might have other options though. Deep Strike is a rule that's listed on a unit's datasheet, and this represents a unit that can basically pop up anywhere around the enemy army, either by teleporting in like these terminators here, some units dropping in from the sky like certain units with jump packs, or perhaps certain units that burrow under the ground like certain tyranid organisms. Units that have this will be listed on their datasheet, you can opt to put them in reserve before deploying the army, and the general rule for these is that when they come in via deep strike, they can be deployed anywhere that's at least 9 inches horizontally from enemy units, but otherwise have free reign over the entire table. 
The 9-inch restriction means that it's often a bit unreliable to get into melee combat with these guys on the turn that they come in, as you'd have to roll quite a high number for the charge. Strategic Reserves is the other major option. Unlike Deep Strike, this doesn't have to be on any specific datasheet, you just get to do this with the vast majority of units in your army for free, everything besides fortifications. The idea behind Strategic Reserves is more forces that you're keeping back to either just keep them safe from enemy firepower and make sure that they get the first strike, or maybe trying to outflank the enemy in some way. For Strategic Reserves, again you declare them before the game begins, and generally speaking you can do this with up to a quarter of your army, in a 1000 point incursion games that'll be 250 points worth of units you can put into strategic reserve, 500 points at the 2000 point strike force mode, and up to 750 points worth of units at the 3000 point incursion. Deep strike doesn't appear to have any such limits as it's a different rule, so unless there's any other restrictions in the exact mission that you're playing, you'd be able to use strategic reserves up to these points caps, and then also use any other units that had deep strike, potentially to put really quite a lot of your army off the table if you wanted to. Compared with Deep Strike, Strategic Reserves have a lot more restrictions as to where they can come on, as they basically represent units walking onto the board as opposed to teleporting in or something. They can't arrive at all on turn 1, there's no such core restriction on the Deep Strike rule unless there's one in your mission. On turn 2 they can arrive within 6 inches of any board edge, and they still have the restriction the same as Deep Strike that they can't be within 9 inches of enemy units. And on turn 2 they have the further restriction that they can't deploy in the enemy deployment zone, so it's more going to be in no man's land or your own battle lines. From battle rounds 3 onwards though, that restriction is lifted, provided there's enough room for them and the opponent hasn't screened them out, then you could have them arriving in the enemy drop zone. In general Deep Strike is a lot more freeing, but locks to certain data sheets, unlike strategic reserves, which you could use for basically anything. When your units actually turn up from reserve, they count as having made a normal move. That could be relevant for some rules like the heavy weapons that we mentioned earlier, and in general you wouldn't be able to select to move them again once they've turned up, as the move units part of the movement phase has already passed. Otherwise though, beyond that, they can basically just act normally. They can still shoot with their weapons, so you could have a unit turn up from reserves and lay into the foe with some heavy firepower, and they can also declare a charge as well. You'd usually need a 9 or a 2d6 dice roll to succeed and get into an engagement range, provided you've deployed as close as possible to the enemy unit. Any reserves that you choose not to deploy or forget about till the end of the game basically count as destroyed, and after reinforcement units turn up, it's basically the start of your shooting phase and the end of the movement phase. With reserves in 40k, I'd say it's often worth having maybe one or two units go into reserve, though I probably wouldn't go too mad on it unless your army has got some special rules that interact with it. If you use it a bit too heavily, you might just not have enough threat on the board to overcome the enemy army in the first few turns, and generally you do want to be scoring objectives fairly early in 40k. So anyway, just to recap quickly, the movement phase follows the command phase, the active player moves all of their units, most of them having the option to either normal move, advance, fall back from enemy units, or remain stationary, a bunch of those having different restrictions or benefits. Then after you've moved units, your reinforcements come in, should you have any, usually greater than 9 inches away from the enemy horizontally, and again might have further restrictions based on the mission, or whether you're using deep strike or strategic reserve. In the next video we'll be moving on to the shooting phase of Warhammer 40k 10th edition, feel free to check out the other videos in this series, so far there's been one on the things that you'll need to play Warhammer 10th edition, and also on the command phase. I'll be aiming to keep up with this series until we've covered how to play 40k in entirety. If you've enjoyed the video then feel free to subscribe to the channel, and I would just like to mention that one way that you can help support the channel is via the Patreon page if you found these videos useful and you'd like to keep them coming. Channel patrons do get a few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things come next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some really big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.